Okay, now that I have you exactly where I want you, we're gonna talk about therapy real quick. So, there's this guy. His name is um, Carl Rogers. Carl Rogers is from the 1900s, like probably 1980s, something like that. <laughs> but he's a um, he's a psychologist, well, a, a psychotherapist, really. His approach to therapy was called client-centered therapy, and that's when the therapist chooses to um, allow the client to really lead the sessions. Like, um, they're more focused on the client's needs their feelings and the therapist shows empathy like oh i feel you you know <laughs> for example say you come into my office and i make you feel very comfortable like i'm gonna do everything in my power to make sure that you feel comfortable enough to talk to me to confide to vent to really just let your emotions flow as you're talking about what you're concerned with while you're there. It's like a non-direct way for a therapist to lead the session. Like instead of them taking the lead, they're gonna let the client come to them about what's bothering them. And in that way, they're making an environment where the client feels comfortable they feel like they're being listened to they're being heard and that's the kind of approach I would take as a therapist because it's a lot soft it's a lot more <laughs> it's a lot soft it's a lot more gentle really that humanistic approach is going to encourage the client to be more thoughtful towards themselves like they're going to actually take the time out and reach a point of self-actualization which is on the maslow's hierarchy of needs um i think it's at the top yeah self-actualization so self-actualization on the pyramid of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is that pyramid that we, these are like the different tiers that we need to feel fulfilled, uh, to feel whole uh, as a person. Um, so at the very top is self-actualization, which is your morality, your problem solving, your creativity, um, your passions, desires that's your self-actualization that's when you're able to really look at yourself and be like okay this this is what i need to work on these are the things that i've been pushing off that i haven't really figured out yet that's self-actualization i feel like carl rogers he, he really talks about empathy and how showing empathy to another person is it goes a lot further than you would think and you don't really find it too often out in the world now um but that's usually what people are looking for is like someone who is genuine and is actually going to empathize with them relate to them listen to them um yeah and he says that it's one of the most important components of a genuine comfortable relationship that a high degree of empathy in a relationship is possibly the most potent factor and certainly one of the most potent factors in bringing about change and learning empathy being able to feel someone else and how they're feeling help them with uh, their way of thinking, their way of behaving, um, but also make them feel like they're at home in a sense. So yeah, I feel like that's a really great approach to therapy. Um, 
I've been in therapy myself and my therapist, she pretty much talked to me like I was one of her kids. Like <laughs> She was a mother figure pretty much to me, but she was an older woman. Um, but what she did was she made me feel very comfortable enough to talk to her about my issues, to um, vent to her and stuff like that. So as a therapist, that's one of the main things you want with your client is to make them feel comfortable um, because no one's going to want to talk to a therapist if they don't feel like the therapist is one listening to them. That's like the whole point. So, yeah. And even in non-therapeutic environments, like just in casual everyday relationships, it's so important to listen to that other person um, and for them to do the same to you. It's just reciprocity, reciprocity, <laughs> reciprocus, reciproc reciprocation. <laughs> yes, the practice of exchanging things with others for mutual benefit. <laughs> yeah. I think people tend to be fearful of emotions and feeling their emotions, especially when it comes to others having emotions. Like, I can't tell you how many times um, others would tell me that they don't feel, they feel bad for coming to me with their issues. And I'd be like, it's okay. I'm here. That's what friends do. You don't have to feel bad about wanting me to listen to how you feel that's like the easiest thing for me i'm a great listener <laughs> because i feel like because you would want someone to do the same for you i think some people when they think of therapy and they don't really know much about it they see it as like something that they're really not going to get much out of um like a waste of time because they don't feel like they're going to be listened to in the sessions so there's different types of therapy, but client-centered therapy is really all about you. Then in turn, the therapist will listen, provide you with empathy, um, relatability, um, comfortability. There's a level of unconditional positive regard for the patient and how they're feeling and you know a level of respect and dignity when speaking with someone in these sessions um it's a way of not looking at them as a patient but as a person first so you're gonna really feel like you're supposed to be there you're like you're comfortable in that space it's a safe space for you to be yourself and that's really what client-centered therapy is about. It's going to encourage you, well, as a therapist, they're going to encourage you to reach your fullest potential, um, to want better for yourself, and they're gonna help you get there. With empathy. <laughs> it's like when I tell people I'm a psychology student, I usually get one of two reactions, and one which is, they're running away from me <laughs> they're like you're not about to diagnose me in this conversation most people think i'm like just actively diagnosing them when they talk to me and that's not the case at all or like i've actually had people run away from me in conversation <laughs> or they would just stop talking because they think i'm like analyzing everything they're saying just not the case and the other reaction would be um they're really interested and they actually want me to help them with their issues. Understandable. <laughs> I think one, people are a little scared of therapy and two, there's a stigmatism that therapy isn't gonna actually help you. And client-centered therapy is for you. <laughs> Not me being a spokesperson. <laughs> if you have someone like that in your life, keep them, keep them because I feel like now empathy is very hard to find out here. And if you have someone in your corner who is willing to 
be there for you, help you, encourage you to be better, to improve um, for your own personal growth. You know, it, that's so important to have a support system. And not everyone has the, um, not everybody has access to therapy. And if you do, I encourage you to take advantage of that. The thing about client-centered therapy is that it's flexible in a sense, like it's, um, it's easy to go with the flow which isn't as rigid in structure, you're um, able to think of different ways to talk to a client and it's very non-direct. Um, which makes it more, it makes it easier to approach the client in a certain way that is individual to them because not everybody is the same not everybody thinks and acts and feels the same so when you're able to go to a client and be very flexible with your approach to them and you're receptive to how they are as a person you're able to um help them better I was looking at the page for Carl Rogers on the American Psych Psychological Association website. And they even said there that he was so focused on establishing a personal relationship with clients to get a better insight to their lives and how they feel about themselves and what they believe they should be working on. And they come to a therapist to well, for client-centered therapy to pretty much have a guideline, like a, a mentor almost. Now, let's talk about fate versus free will. I feel like when it comes to taking control of your life, we all have free will. Um, I don't feel like you're really fated to anything. If you choose to not take control of your life, then you are fated to always not be in control of your life <laughs> you're like okay so let me tie this into uh an example from eric erickson so i was reading about one of his theories about escapism okay so conformity is a part of his theory on escapism so he was saying that people are more likely to um conform to society go with the flow, um, blend in pretty much instead of be individual, instead of take control of their lives, instead of being like, this is what I want to do. They're allowing fear to keep them from what they, where they want to be in life. In a sense, like it's a lot easier to just do the norm, what everyone else is doing instead of going against the grain and figuring out for yourself what you want out of life and conformity is a way to escape a way to just go along with the crowd because everyone else is doing it um it's a lot less scary because you're not standing out you don't have to worry about what's going to happen if i do this thing over here that i really want to do and it may not happen the way I think it's gonna happen or I might fail at it or I might succeed at it, I don't know. That's what escapism is gonna allow you to stay where you're at. It's gonna keep you in the flow of the way things are supposed to go, you know? Um, so when it comes to fate, I don't really feel like you're fated to anything unless, well, when it comes to self-improvement, I don't really feel like you're fated to succeed or fail unless you choose one or the other. You choose to self-improve and you are committed to that. Then I feel you are fated to succeed. 
um, and vice versa. All right, that's it. That's all. Bye.